Well, I'll, um, I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for today. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. Just uh, bless our uh, time together and just uh, give us clarity of thought as we uh, work on this, this material. Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I'm um, not sure where to start here. I mean, uh, so I guess I probably should give the big picture of what we're doing in here. Um, as you guys know, I've been working on this, this so-called A-calculus for a few years with different students, and so I wanted to just try to collect all of the, uh, all the things we've done into a kind of course and um, see if we can't sort of understand things better. And um, so what is A-calculus? Yes, Matthew? Yes, you may eat the Smarties. <laughs> Um, so a calculus, roughly speaking, is just the study of calculus where instead of working with real numbers, we're working with elements of some algebra. So, um, you know, there's already a very popular, <laughs> very, very popular, well-known example of this called complex analysis, right? We work with complex differentiation, complex integration, and that's proved to be incredibly useful. So the, the larger question I have is, can you do this for other, other algebras? Um, and so for, for me, when I say algebra, what that, what that means to me is an associative real um, finite dimensional uh, associative real finite dimensional um, Um, unital <laughs> algebra. Now, what does that mean? I mean, so what I'm, when I say real, I mean, I would still say the complex numbers are in algebra, it's, but they're also, of course, um, you know, they, they are a real vector space. And so that's what I'm talking, the reality, real, uh, what I mean there is that this A is first a um, n-dimensional vector space over R, right? Um, so that's the finite dimensionality. And, uh, you know, the associative and the unital, well, that speaks to the multiplication. So we're assuming that it's an n-dimensional vector space over R paired with the multiplication, which I, I like to use star just when I'm trying to communicate sort of the generic features. But then whenever I actually get into an actual example, Invariably, I find myself using juxtaposition for the, for the operation because the star gets old um, for actual examples, but it's nice at this level. So a star is a mapping from A cross A to A, right? You might say it's a multiplication, and what are the properties we insist it have? So, in fact, I'm already getting tired of writing star. I'm going to use asterisk. <laughs> um, so, of course, we insist that um, X star Y plus Z is x star y plus x star z. We insist that, likewise, if we have x plus y star z, um, we have x star z plus y star z. What else do we insist? It's associative, right? So associative means x star y star z makes sense. Right. I'll add some parentheses here, so I'm actually saying a little bit more, so we can either multiply the first, the last two first and then the first, or we can multiply the first two and then the last without. Anyway, you slice it, we get back the same result. And then the unity. Um, there's a one, all right, so I might say one sub a here for the sake of uh, being overly pedantic. Um, one times a is equal to x. One sub a times x is equal to x, which of course is also equal to x times one sub a. Now, um, now, let's see here. If, in addition, we have that x star y is equal to y star x for all x and y in a, then a is commutative, right? It's a commutative algebra. So, 
I mean, this is a relatively blank slate in terms of algebra. It's um, associative algebras. Um, there's a lot of them, <laughs> and um, generally speaking, it's kind of uh, uh, it's not as nice as some of the things you find in your standard coursework. I mean, if you look at typical abstract algebra books, this has been relegated to like the last chapter. And even there, they really only talk about the nice part of the theory, the semi-simple, um, the semi-simple part, and so forth, um, which I will talk about in here eventually. Any questions about this? Let me just check my notes, make sure I'm not missing anything right quick. So you might think of the first two things I wrote there as bilinearity and associativity, the unital condition, commutative, right? Okay, so um, now many of my results that, uh, many of the results we know are just for the commutative case, but we also, I also know a fair amount of things about the non-commutative case. There's, um, I think, a few different things we've done where I haven't really asked, carefully asked the question, could I also do this in the non-commutative case? Those kind of I've left as future student projects down the road somewhere. I don't know. But, um, and you just get tired of thinking about non-commutative stuff at some point. Because, like, I don't know, when you, when you turn off the non-commutative, I mean, when, you, when you add the commutative condition, things just start results just start flying together. And as soon as you turn, turn off that, it just slows things down so much. It's just painful. All right. Um, yes? What? Um, why don't you go play your watch? A battery? Already? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, what's that? It's okay. It's still got battery. Oh, you're tricking me, huh? Oh, it turned itself off. I see, I see. Okay. All right, so, um, the, um, the main tool to study just associative algebras, um, and, and these were, they have been called linear associative algebras. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty typical term you'll find 1970 or before. These are linear associative algebras. Maybe it's still, still used. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, so um, a lot of the literature doesn't really work with, it's, it, uh, no one, quite has the patience to do what I'm about to do in a lot of the literature, but I think it's important to, uh, to think some about a basis. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a real vector space, and so you can, you can pick a basis for the vector space, and you can do things with respect to that basis. Um, a lot of times we identify A with Rn, and then that makes things nicer. Um, but before I get to that, I should talk about something more basic, which is left and right multiplication, right? So left multiplication. And um, so I would, you know, you may say L, L sub alpha of X is um, alpha. Maybe use something other than X. Let's say uh, A there. Ooh, now the Greeks will be confused. Let's try something else. Um, maybe B there. Uh, so A times alpha. Oh, this would be stink. B. <laughs> I'll get it eventually. B times A, right? On the other hand, um, the right multiplication uh, would be, I mean, I don't, have, I don't have, I don't guess I have a standard symbol for it, but say script R sub B of A would be what? Um, a times B, right? And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things we can just pause and notice, if we look at, uh, the left multiplication map, uh, let's say by A, composed with the right multiplication by B, and I'll let it act on, um, oh, why am I fighting it? X, there we go. Um, then that would be what? That would be left multiplication by A of right multiplication by B of X, right? Which would be um, A 
star parentheses, um, x star b, right? But since the algebra we're working with is associative, um, we could write that's really a times x, right? Uh, times b. And that's actually what? That's, uh, that's the right multiplication by b um, acting on the left multiplication by a of x. In other words, it's r sub b composed of l sub a of x for all x. So, you know, sometimes you might run across a statement that associativity in an algebra is equivalent to the assumption that the right and left multiplication maps commute. Um, so that's, that's an interesting tidbit. I don't find myself using this much because I, I mostly work with left multiplication maps, all right? Um, in fact, you can prove theorem, um, and I call this R sub A. What is that, what's that going to be? That's going to be, um, uh, let's say, T um, from V, oh, listen to me, V, T from A to A such that um, t of x star y is equal to t of x star y. This is the so-called um, regular representation. Regular representation of the algebra, right? And the theorem is that this um, consists of left multiplication maps. <laughs> and is naturally isomorphic to A as an algebra. All right. Now, I was tempted to start saying something about a basis, but that's, I'm getting a cart ahead of the horse. We don't need to say anything about a basis. This is just abstract linear algebra, essentially. Uh, so, first of all, let me show you that any, um, anything in the regular representation of A has to be a left multiplication, right? Pretty simple. Note that T um, in the regular representation has T of X equals to T of X, um, T of one times X, right? Which is T of one times X using the property, right? Let me name that property. That property is what I call right linear, right a linearity, right a linear. It's unfortunate, but the first paper I published um, with uh, Spencer and and Belu and and Min, I had the uh, left right terminology juxtaposed, and that predates back to me. I think even in my thesis on supermath, I have a confusion between the left and right terminology. And it's because I, I was trying to be consistent with literature, and I think I didn't notice that some of the literature has the left and the right flippy flopped. And so anyway, I'm doing my best to be across the board consistent from everything I'm putting out there now, right a linear. But the thing that I think the thing that'll trip you up is the right a linear maps are all left multiplications. Yeah. As you can see from this simple calculation right here. See, this is nothing, this shows you that thus t is nothing more than left multiplication by t of whatever value it takes of the identity. Right? Do you guys see what I'm saying? I mean, if you don't understand, you gotta. You know, just interrupt. I already, I, I already understand these things. I'm not talking for me. 
Um, uh, okay, so then, in fact, it's, it's a simple exercise to show that this um, regular representation is, in fact, closed, and it's a vector space, and composition of maps makes it into an algebra, all right? So let me just focus on the question of the isomorphism. What's the isomorphism from A? Um, what's the isomorphism? The isomorphism, I'll just call it psi for the moment. Let's say going from, which way do you want to go? From A to RA or the other way around? Let's go from A to RA. A to the regular representation of A is we do phi of um, x is equal to what? Let me do phi of a. You guys can guess. I mean, what's the isomorphism? There's really only one. You need to give me uh, something in the regular representation that's based on a. There's only one choice, really. I just showed you every thing in the, what's that? Let me tell you, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a push. It's a left multiplication map. <laughs> T of A, but there's no T here. It has to be based on just A alone. Yeah. So that's the thing. You, you trade the algebra element for left multiplication by the algebra element. That's the isomorphism. And it's so simple that there's many papers and books and stuff you can read that they won't even really explain this. They'll just use it. And there'll be like a sentence somewhere that says making an identification. So it's whatever. Um, okay, so here's the proof that that's actually an isomorphism. The interesting part of the proof, at least. I mean, it's, it's, it's simple enough to see that this is an additive map. Right, like L of psi of A plus B is L of A plus B and if you think about the, that being L of A plus L of B, that's exactly the same as one of the first two conditions I wrote on the algebra, right? It's part of the bilinearity, as I, as I, as I call it in the paper. Um, so I'll focus on the, the composition issue, right? So like psi of A times B, what's that? Well, that's, you know, by definition, L of A um, times b, right? But it's a simple exercise. You can prove that that's L of a composed, right, with L of b. Right, you can, you can easily prove that these two maps are equal. Just let them act on x and use associativity. Maybe not even that. Maybe just definition of left multiplication and composition. And then, so this, of course, is nothing more than psi of a composed with psi of b. So what we see is that multiplication in the algebra um, becomes composition in the left, in, in the regular representation. Yes, Matthew? Yeah, you can have that. No basis to be seen so far, right? But you notice that for this to be um, an isomorphism, I mean, the fact that, the fact that this is surjective um, is largely based on the, the calculation right before, right? If you didn't have an identity in the algebra, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think you'd be, there's, I'm not sure what would happen then. But anyway, there's always a way to adjoin an, an identity to an algebra anyway. That's like a standard construction you might remember. Um, from when you took Math 422. Wait a minute. Let me see. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm trying to remember what the, if I have a notation for this or not, I don't, I don't remember if I actually do, um, anyway, let's, let's move on. So if we, um, if we pick a basis, all right, then there's lots of other bells and whistles to think about. Um, Let's talk about that. So, 
So let's suppose beta equal to, let's say, v1, v2, da da vn is basis for algebra A, which again, let it be understood, that means a real associative finite dimensional unidual algebra. Okay. Um, then you can define structure constants. Um, Vi star Vj is equal to the sum over K. Yes, Matthew? Nothing. nothing. Just nothing? Yeah. Oh, man, when did I? I can't find my structure constants. Goodness gracious, I, uh, I wait a while to talk about these in the paper. I'm all the way over to page 17. Um, that was part of, part of my um, goal in writing this paper was actually to pretty much remove the structure constants from the discussion as much as possible. Um, see, and that's the big difference. If you go back and you look at the um, foundational papers by Ward and Wagner from the 40s and the early 50s, um, you know, it's just a sea of structure constants. And the reg everything's done with respect to a basis. The, um, the structure constants, depending on whether you look at which pair of indices is either the left or right regular representation or what's called a para-isotropic matrix. And they use all three of those sub-selections of the structure constants to make theorems. And so one of my major goals has been to try to translate those things into abstract linear algebra in as much as possible. But sometimes you've got to do a calculation. Sometimes you've got to pick a basis. I mean, calculus is done with respect to a basis. Right? Complex analysis is done with respect to the basis 1i. It's not done in a basis-independent way, right? Not really. So we do have to deal with calculations. We do have to talk about bases. It's not avoidable. And here's one of the first things. Um, and yet we don't want to talk about them when we can because there's insight which is gained from the coordinate-free viewpoint also. Anyway, um, this is the structure constants. And they have to exist because the algebra is closed. And there's also conditions that have to be met on these to in indicate you know, the, um, the associativity and the, uni and the uh, unital condition. I'm not especially interested in those. I mean, you can figure those out. Maybe they'll make good homework problems. I don't know. But uh, these are the structure constants. And, um, you know, turning the tables a bit, if you're given a real vector space and a proper set of structure constants, right, extending by linearity, by linearly off this, will define a multiplication just the same. So you could start with the structure constants and build the algebra from there, too. But anyway, these are the structure constants. Um, but also, um, if T is an element of the regular representation of A, then the matrix, um, well then, let's see here, the matrix of an element A with, res I don't know, I, I got a stupid notation here, uh, M sub beta of A. So let's say that this is the matrix of the algebra element A with respect to the basis beta. What's this going to be? This is going to be the matrix of the left multiplication map by A with respect to the basis beta, which in my obnoxious notation is beta comma beta. Ooh, fidget spinning. So last year. It's here. Um, So that, that is, this is the so-called matrix rep regular representation of a matrix regular representation of a with respect to basis beta for a. Maybe instead of a, I should use, let me, let me use something else like uh, z. 
since I'm using A for the algebra too, this will make it stand out, uh, make it pop a little bit more. There we go. Um, you guys know enough to know that my letters are not reserved. Although I will never use A as anything except for an algebra. I mean, the, the capital math calligraphic, calligraphic A. Okay, so that, that's the definition of the matrix regu regular representation with respect to a basis. And, um, you know, we can be a little bit more explicit. What does that mean in terms of linear algebra? Well, that, right, is, what is that? I mean, it's... Um, Specifically, what's left multiplication by z? Well, that's, you know, we take the left multiplication by z map, we feed it the first basis element, and we take, calculate the beta coordinates of that. And then we take the left multiplication by z map, we feed it the basis element v2, we look at the beta coordinates of that, <laughs> and so forth and so on. We look at the left multiplication by z of the nth basis element, and we look at the beta coordinates of that. <laughs> and that's what that means in terms of abstract linear algebra. Although maybe it's not that abstract. Um, and so explicitly that means z times v1, right? z times v2. And so forth and so on. You know, z times vn, the beta coordinates of that. Um, and that's about as good as it gets for an abstract for like an abstract basis. I mean, that, that's, that's nice, it's useful, but this is much nicer um, if we make an additional condition, right? How about what, what if, what happens when, um, you know, if we, well, first of all, if we make V1 the uh, unit in the algebra, then the first column is just the coordinate vector of, 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 of Z, right? Um, but the, the nicest case, nicest case would be when we have, you know, A equal to Rn as a point set, right? A equal to Rn as a point set. We use beta as the standard, standard basis, right? And also with E1 equal to the identity in the algebra. That's, that's, that's the absolute nicest case, and that's what most, like most things you'll read have this assumption, like a lot of things anyway. So with all that, I would just say the matrix of Z, there's no need to talk about a basis because it's the standard basis, right? The matrix of Z is just what? It's, um, it's Z, and then Z times E2, and so forth and so on until we get to z times the n. So many of my examples, in fact, almost all of them fall under this, this umbrella of thinking. But it's important not to insist that E1 be the identity in general, because there are interesting examples where the identity is not, you, can't, you don't want to make the identity the first element of the algebra. Okay, the, the principal example of that being the uh, matrix algebras. Um, in the matrix algebras, if you use the basis of matrix units, the identity is like the sum of E11, E22, E33, da 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 da, da you know, ENN, and so, eh, anyway. Or also the direct product of algebras. Um, there the identity is not usually viewed as E1. I'll make this explicit in our examples, but. Okay, so that, that's the basics. Uh, this is the regular representation, the matrix regular representation. So we have basically three different pictures of the algebra. Algebra is an abstract algebra. We have the regular representation of, of endomorphisms of the algebra, linear transformations that, dis, that are the right linear maps. Um, that's a very small subspace of the set of all endomorphisms, right? Because if you look at that, that's n-dimensional. How big is the set of all linear transformations on A? It's, it's n-squared dimensional, right? Because it's as big as n by n matrices. Likewise, these kinds of matrices are very special. You know, if you think about all n by n matrices, not many of them are going to have this shape. This is a very peculiar, specific type of n by n matrix. 
It's an n-dimensional subs subspace of the set of matrices. That's again an isomorphism to our, our n-dimensional algebra. So it's a kind of greedy canvas in some sense. I mean, we're, we're taking a n-dimensional object and we're looking at it from the viewpoint of something n-squared dimensional in terms of embedding. It's pretty, it's pretty greedy, right? I mean, you're look, if you're looking at a, a three-dimensional algebra, you're using a nine-dimensional algebra, nine-dimensional object to kind of get your paws on it. So it is, it is very freeing. I mean, you can, you can use matrices to model so many different things, you know. Okay. Yes. Oh. No. Not now. Now? Oh, man. Oh. Most unfortunate. Can you, you gotta have to wait a little bit, okay? You have to wait. What? Pause. <laughs>